government of Venezuela called on Thursday its ambassador for consultation to Spain due to recent statements made by the Spanish Minister of Defense, Margarita Robles. In Colombia, President Gustavo Petro denounced that a coup d'etat is preparing against his government. And the first troops from Jamaica and Belize for the multinational security support mission arrived in Port-au-Prince, Haiti on Thursday and will join the 400 agents from Kenya who are already in the country. Hello and welcome to From the South. My name is Belen de los Santos. I'm from Cesar Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. The government of Nicolás Maduro called on Thursday for consultation its ambassador to Spain due to recent statements made by the Spanish Def Minister of Defense, Margarita Robles. Robles discredited the government of President Maduro by calling it a dictatorship while showing her partiality with the self-exiled Venezuelan opposition leader Edmundo González Urrutia. Venezuelan Foreign Minister Ivan Gil described as insolent, interfering and rude the expressions made by Minister Robles. In view of this situation, the Venezuelan government has decided to recall the Venezuelan ambassador to the Kingdom of Spain, Gladys Gutierrez, for consultations. In this context, the president of the Venezuelan National Assembly, Jorge Rodriguez, requested the rupture of relations with the European nation. And on Friday, the Foreign Minister of Venezuela, Ivan Hill, issued a statement to celebrate the first anniversary of the strengthening of bilateral relations between Venezuela and China. The head of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs asserted the president of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro, on behalf of the Venezuelan people and the Bolivarian government, is pleased to express to the president of the People's Republic of China, Xi Jinping, his government and the brotherly Chinese people, the feeling of joy and celebration on the first anniversary of the establishment of the all-weather strategic partnership between the two sister nations. The foreign Venezuelan minister also said that on September 13, 2023, a historical presidential summit was held in Beijing where both heads of state reached broad consensus and agreed that Venezuela and China are in a new stage of binational and international relations, showing that the relationship is as solid as a rock and that it will only grow in the years to come, fulfilling the legacy initiated by leaders Hugo Chavez Frias and Jing Zemin. The ministry further pointed out that the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela reaffirms its commitment to continue working hard to expand and strengthen the relations of friendship and sisterhood with the People's Republic of China in order to ensure greater welfare and happiness for both people, as well as joint efforts in building a new world of balance, friendship and peace, free of cross hegemony and attached to international law. The foreign minister, Ivan Hill, underscored the solid relations between Venezuela and China have been set under the principles of self-determination and sovereign equality of the states inspired by the highest human values that must govern the community of nations and their common destiny. We continue in Venezuela as President Nicolás Maduro denounced a wave of global aggressions loaded with fascist policies aimed at discrediting the government. These statements were made after the president led the 16th anniversary of the youth of the United Socialist Party of Venezuela from the anti-imperialist rebellion square located in the city of Caracas. President Maduro affirmed that the Venezuelan youth must unite in the struggle against Washington originated conspiracies. The Venezuelan head of state also denounced violent plans promoted by the extreme right wing to achieve their particular objectives. We have to put up a tremendous fight for the mind, for the values, for the ideal of our homeland. Especially now, when Venezuela is being attacked worldwide. The U.S. imperialism believes it can conquer and colonize Venezuela. Are you going to let imperialism take Venezuela? They believe they can impose fascism by force. 
with hate, intolerance, and division. Are you going to let fascism fill Venezuela with violence? They are evil. I said it so many times in the pilgrimage. This is a battle between good, between truth, between justice, and them. And we go now to Ecuador as supporters of former Vice President Jorge Glass held protest on Thursday in the main cities of the country to demand his freedom after being arrested on April 5th during a police raid on the Embassy of Mexico in Quito. Precisely in the Ecuadorian capital, dozens of people gathered in front of the National Court of Justice where his detention was ruled as legal. The Guayaquil protests were held before the governor's office of Guayas in the city where Glass, who was vice president to Rafael Correa's government, is currently imprisoned. In this context, former member of the National Assembly, Sofia Espina, denounced aggressions against the demonstrators in Guayaquil and assured that consulates abroad have been closed to not receive the petitions of migrant brothers for glass freedom. <laughs> And also in Ecuador, the director of the Literal Penitentiary, Maria Daniela Icasa, was killed on Thursday in an attack. The attack against Maria Daniela Icasa and her companion, a prison official that ended up wounded, occurred on the road between the town of Daule and the city of Guayaquil, where the penitentiary is located. Icasa was on her way to the Wasmosur Hospital, located in the south of Guayaquil, when armed men intercepted the vehicle and shot at her while she was in the passenger seat. The authorities initially reported that Icasa had managed to be taken alive to the hospital, but later confirmed her death. And now let's take a short break where remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English where you will find news in different formats, news updates and much more. We'll be right back, stay with us. Welcome back from the South. In Colombia, President Gustavo Petro denounced that a coup d'etat is preparing against his government. The president emphasized that the accusations against him are a reflection of the coup d'etat that is being carried out by illegitimate administrative bodies. Petro is being accused of a supposed violation of the law through an alleged exceeding of the spending ceilings in the electoral campaign that led him to the presidency. He stated that the intention is to remove him from power by means of an assassination or a political destitution in the next three months and replaced him with the president of the Senate, Efrain Cepeda. In this way, he denounced that there are economic interests to produce a political process of destitution of the legitimate president of the country. El golpe de Estado no solo generales. The coup d'etat is not the general of the police and the army looking for a way to take Galas and remove the president. No, the oligarchs of this country are not so naive. It is a Colombian style coup d'etat. First, they disqualify the president that the constitution protected. Over the constitution, there is already a coup d'etat. The president's immunity was granted to prevent any administrative instance from judging him. And today, I am being judged by an illegitimate administrative instance. And Colombia seeks to redefine labor rights for young apprentices through a labor reform. Our partner, Valeria Cardona, has the details in the following report. The National Apprenticeship Service, SENA, has about 442,000 apprentices in 33 regions of the country. In the final stage of their training, apprentices are linked to companies for internships, which in some cases are remunerated, although in most cases they do not receive any financial remuneration. We are not asking for something new, but on the contrary, we are talking about a historical revindication of the Sena apprentices. 
The other is because we know that the Sena apprentices are one of the most vulnerable populations in economic terms. Sena apprentices are the same ones who sometimes have to decide between having breakfast or paying for public transportation to get to the training center and get trained. In other words, they are a vulnerable population in economic terms and for this reason, I and many of us feel that they should be paid a salary. Apprentices, instructors, members of the student committee, and even graduates of the Sena, who are now members of Congress, watch over the rights of apprentices and seek the laborization of the apprenticeship contract through the labor reform, which is currently under discussion in Congress. There are two main modalities which are very sad for the hiring of young workers. One is internship, which is also widely applied, and the other is the apprenticeship contract. The current labor reform is including this first discussion, but a discussion that is much more than labor is pending, and it is that a human being cannot be sent to a company without pay, because that corresponds not to the capitalist mode of production, but to slave-like socioeconomic formation. Arias, a Senate graduate, is now working as a senator for the labor rights of the apprentices of this institution, where he studied in the late 1970s and early 1980s, when the apprenticeship contract enjoyed the labor character that was taken away with the reform of the year 2000. His aspiration is that today's apprentices who have this type of contract enjoy guarantees such as social security and severance payments. It is a fundamental right of us apprentices, yes, in the companies, just as the ordinary worker has the right to social benefits and to a legal minimum wage. We as apprentices also have rights. The linking of Sen apprentices through the apprenticeship contract in the companies under a labor character is one of the 73 articles that were approved in the first discussion of the labor reform in the House of Representatives, with the objective of dignifying the conditions of the apprentices of the largest public educational institution in the country. Valeria Cardona, Telesur, Bogotá, Colombia. And Brazilian authorities in Manaus, the capital of the state of Amazonas, declared an emergency situation due to a drought affecting the Negro River and are implementing countermeasures. The state of emergency begins on Monday, September 16th, with the first phase of Operation Drought in compliance with a decree with the delivery of basic supplies, food baskets, and kits for families in the communities of the Negro and Amazonas rivers. At least 7,700 families will benefit, corresponding to almost 25,000 people from 93 riverside communities in the capital. And in Vietnam, rescue teams found alive 123 people who had gone missing after the typhoon Yagi hit the northern region. Authorities report. 115 residents of Kobang village fled in the middle of the night into the mountains as they had detected signs of an imminent landslide which would eventually bury several houses in their area. Thus they had been registered as missing for several days until rescue teams found them after an intensive search. Hours later eight more survivors were located in a new village where a landslide destroyed 37 homes. As of Friday, the death toll from the aftermath of Typhoon Yagi has reached 233, while 103 are still missing. And we have a second short break coming up, but before we invite you to visit our YouTube channel at Telesur English, there you will be able to rewatch our interviews, top stories, special broadcastings, and more. Hit the subscribe button and activate the notification bell to stay up to date on the world's most recent events. Final short break, don't go away. Welcome back from the South. Panama recognizes the relatives of the January 9th martyrs 
60 years after the heroic date in which students from the National Institute crossed the fence that divided the U.S.-dominated canal enclave from the rest of the country. There are conflicting opinions on the matter. Our colleague Regna Chandiramani tells us about it. The government of Panama began to pay an annuity to the relatives of the martyrs and survivors of the January 9, 1964 heroic deed, which left 22 Panamanians dead after the struggle to plant the Panamanian flag at the Balboa School in the former Canal Zone, which was controlled until 1999 by the United States. In part, we see the positive point to those who really deserve it. But another part is the way to clean the image of the governments that did not fulfill the obligation to solve the fact of those boys. Because today many have already disappeared, and supposedly it would be those who did not participate who would have benefits, which gives a positive and negative balance. On that day began the heroic deed that lasted several days. When the U.S. military forces stationed in the canal zone repressed the students of the National Institute, who jumped over the fence of the enclave to demand compliance with the treaty in force and the raising of the Panamanian flag together with the American flag in the canal zone. Most of the martyrs were students of the National Institute, the so-called Eagle's Nest. What did the government do? years later so that there would be no way to remember those events. They came and changed the school year, and then they began to end it in December, so that on January 9th there were no students in the classrooms and there was no seed, all that to eliminate the historical memory. We also see later that there was the chair of relations between Panama and the United States. A lady who is from Cologne, by the way, and is currently the Minister of Education again, said that the problems that existed with the United States had already passed and that this chair should be eliminated. There is a systematic approach to eliminate the anti-imperialist struggle of our people. This date is considered by social fighters as the true date of the recovery of sovereignty, which materialized on December 31, 1999 with the transfer of the canal into the hands of the Panamanian government. This economic recognition by the state to the Panamanian martyrs comes 60 years late and leaves a bittersweet taste to many, especially to the victims of the invasion who 25 years after this gesture, returned to feel the U.S. military power without the Panamanian state has been able to cipher, much less to recover the bodies of all the dead. Para Telesur, desde Ciudad de Panamá, Reca Chandiramán. And the first troops from Jamaica and Belize for the multinational security support mission arrived in Port of Prince Haiti on Thursday and will join the 400 agents from Kenya who are already in the country. On the Jamaican side, a contingent of about 20 military personnel and four police arrived at the Toussaint Louverture International Airport in the Haitian capital on Friday, six months after the country announced its support for the multinational mission. Two Belizean soldiers also arrived in Port-au-Prince on Friday on a flight organized by the United States as part of the multinational mission, an operation with UN approval and expected to include at least 2,500 military and police personnel. We go now to Palestine with the Israeli genocidal army committed a new war crime by attacking the Al-Mawasi humanitarian area south of the Gaza Strip, killing dozens of Palestinian civilians. An Israeli incursion into an apartment in the Al-Mawasi area claimed at least five lives of a family, including two children. In addition, seven Gazans couldn't survive the bombing dropped on the refugee camp of Nusrat and the southern city of Rafah. 
In this context, on Friday, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees in the Near East, the UNRWA, denounced that airstrikes killed 18 Palestinians at the Joni School on Wednesday evening at the place had been working as a polio vaccination center for the past week. And in this context, hundreds of Palestinians bid farewell to the remains of five people killed by the Israeli army in two bus in the occupied West Bank. In this way, relatives and residents of the murdered young men mourned their lives in a funeral ceremony held on Friday. The victims died two days ago during an Israeli drone attack. The occupation army withdrew on Thursday evening from the towns of Tulkarem and Tubas and a nearby refugee camp after having besieged both neighborhoods for several days. These aggressions are part of a wider Israeli offensive that has been going on for weeks in the occupied Palestinian territory and which has claimed at least 50 lives. And the government of Cuba offered 200 scholarships for Palestinian students to complete undergraduate and graduate education on the island in the coming years. The announcement was made on Wednesday afternoon when Cuban President Miguel Diaz Canal Bermudez received the ambassador of the state of Palestine, Dr. Akram Mohammad Samhan, who ends his diplomatic mission in the Caribbean nation. The Palestinian diplomat thanked the Cuban president for the support of his country's students, whom Cuba has been protecting and supporting. Currently, 250 students from Palestine are studying in the Caribbean island, pursuing undergraduate and postgraduate studies in different higher education centers. And like this, we have come to the end of this news brief. You can find this and many other stories on our website at tesserenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram, and also on TikTok. For Tesser English, my name is Belen de los Santos. Thank you for watching.